If you want to study tiny amounts of RNA and DNA without getting in their way, well radioactive labeling is here to save the day. So let's talk about the how and the why of radio labeling. And so, yes, we still do use radioactivity all the time. In fact, I was just in this morning in here um, cleaning out some of my old radio labeled um, RNAs as I get move, ready to move for my postdoc. And so, yes, it's still a technique that is used very widely and it has advantages over fluorescence. It's super duper 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 sensitive um, and it's less bulky. Um, there's a lot of benefits. And so I want to tell you about some of those, some of the uses of radio labeling um, and also how we do it. So I'm going to talk mainly about five prime end radio labeling, where so you will replace a phosphorus on the end of the DNA or the RNA. You basically add a radioactive phosphorus, and this is gonna allow you to track the molecule. And there, this is like the easiest method. There are also other methods that I'll talk about, um, body labeling, three prime labeling, um, primer labeling, various things like that. Um, but I'll go into more detail about how I actually do it in practice when I'm doing this end label, this five prime end labeling. So let's start with, um, let me convince you why we're using this in the first place and the theory behind how it works. And then we'll go into the really practical stuff. We'll get more into the why of like how radioactivity actually works. But just now, for now, just know that we replace a version of a normal element such as phosphorus with a radioactive version. And when we say radioactive, it's going to behave identically pretty much to normal phosphorus, but it's going to go undergo this like radioactive decay and give off these high energy particles that we can then detect with like a screen or some other um, method. And this is going to be super duper sensitive. And so it's gonna allow us to use really, really tiny amounts of our RNA or DNA. And then we can do things to study how they are interacting, um, where they're going, how they're getting modified, all sorts of different things. And so I typically do RNA labeling in, when, for like slot blotting assays where I'm trying to measure protein RNA um, binding ability. And this is really important that I can use this tiny little amount because it's going to allow me to then have basically this technique, I'll, I'll get into another post, but you need a tiny little amount of RNA. So this is perfect for it. Also, if you were to use a fluorescent tag, the tag it interfere, it like binds non-specifically to the membrane and you can have all sorts of problems like that. Plus the protein I study, it actually binds to the ends of the RNA. And so you wouldn't want to have a modification on those ends, this big bulky modification that wouldn't work for actually being able to study it. So radioactive is activity is great for a couple purposes there. Another use, um, you could use it, way you could use it to study an RNA protein interaction is with EMSA, so electrophoretic mobility shift assay, more on this in another post, but it, you are basically measuring RNA protein binding in a gel. A lot of the methods that we're using when we're doing labeled nucleic acid are involving gels. So just as gel, these are often like urea gel or something, some sort of polyacrylamide gel that's going to allow us to separate the molecules by their size. Often you see radioactivity used um, studying RNA or DNA in these really, really long gels, these like sequencing gels. This is one I actually did during a laboratory rotation where I was studying this um, terminal ureteral transferase, this tutase. Um, and so basically it adds these use onto the end of an RNA. And so you can see that as more U's were added, you get this long thing. And so you do these really long gels so you can tell apart these individual, these RNAs that differ in a single base. And so there's such, and the radioactivity, having the radioactive version is, allows you to see these really tiny amounts on these really, um, really big gels. Um, you can also use it for things like DNA's one footprinting. So if you want to see where a protein is binding on a DNA, you can, let mix the protein and the DNA, and you have the DNA labeled on one end, where the protein, and then you have the add DNAs one, which is a, it's a DNA, so it's gonna cut DNA, but it can't cut the DNA if a protein is found there. And so you have it in, in like a low concentration and you have one end labeled. So you get on average like one nick per strand, and then the strand is going to be the size of the label of the piece before it was like cut. And so if there's a protein there, the basic idea is that you can't get a cut site there. And so you're going to see protection on your gel. You can also use 
it for things like a toe printing, um, like a ribosomal toe printing. So here you have the where the ribosome is bound. You can actually use a radioactive primer and then get it to copy this until it hits the ribosome and then it can't, um, it's blocked from copying further. And so you're going to get a piece that is um, representing the place where it's like the length it went until it could stop. And then you could tell where the ribosome was stalled. So this is a technique that I might actually get to use in my postdoc. And so I've been learning more about it um, and it's pretty cool. Other times you don't actually use a gel, um, so some other purposes or some other uses. So we talked about when I did my post on blotting, there's like a southern blot and a northern blot. And in these cases, you're using radioactive DNA probes in order to check for the um, for sequences that complement it. So you separate, you take DNA and southern blot or RNA and a northern blot, and you're looking for a specific sequence. So you run a gel to separate those pieces by their size, and then you transfer it to a membrane, and then you probe it to see um, if the complementary sequence was present, taking advantage of the strand-to-strand -strand complementarity, and the fact that you can radio label these RNA, these DNA pieces to allow them to serve as probes. And then you can see if the specific DNA or RNA was there. So now that I've convinced you that radioactivity is super duper useful, well, what is it? So to answer this question, we need to go back to the very, very basics of what elements are, what atoms are. And so when we talk about elements, we have nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, all of these different elements. For a full listing, see your periodic table of elements. Um, and so each of these elements is defined by the number of protons it has. So a carbon, it, see the six here, it tells you it has six protons. A nitrogen, it has a seven protons. Oxygen, eight protons. Hydrogen, um, one proton. Phosphorus, which we're going to be talking about more today, 15, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But protons aren't the only thing inside of an element, inside of an atom. There's also other subatomic particles. So the three main ones are going to be the protons, and these protons are positively charged. The neutrons, which are neutral, and the protons and the neutrons are hanging out in this dense central nucleus. And then around them is this electron cloud, and the electrons are negatively charged. Our protons is set, but the number of electrons and the number of neutrons can vary. If we change the number of electrons, because electrons are negatively charged and they're equal and oppositely charged to protons, so it has like um, the number, uh, if you have a neutral molecule, it'll have an equal number of electrons and protons. If you have more electrons or less electrons than protons, then you are going to have a charged molecule or an ion, we call it an ion. What if you change the number of neutrons? If we change the number of neutrons, we don't get ions, we don't get charged particles. Instead, we get nuclear isotopes. And so these, these nuclear isotopes may or may not be radioactive. So basically, the, the neutrons, although they don't get that much attention typically because they're kind of just like neutral and they're in this nucleus, they're not interacting with other things, they're playing a key role in helping hold together the atom, hold together all of those positively charged protons because like charges repel each other. And so the neutrons are really playing a key role in keeping that all glued together. This is less of an issue when you have a smaller element, but when you have a bigger element where there's more protons, then the neutrons, you often see there's more neutrons, like a greater excess of neutrons helping glue things together. But sometimes you can have the neutron proton balance be like, like be too much or too little. And so if you get this hap you have this happen, you get a nuclear isotope that is radioactive. And what this means is that it basically, it can kind of rearrange itself and give off a high energy particle in order to kind of get itself in a more comfy position. And so some nuclear isotopes are like radioactive and some are just like heavier or lighter than like the average version. So one of them that we take advantage of a lot in the lab, especially when we're talking about DNA and RNA labeling is P32, so phosphorus 32. So if you have, when you look at one of these numbers, um, so this 15, this is a number that you would see on the periodic table. So you can see phosphorus 15, and this is telling you the number of protons. 
The number up here, this is telling you the number of nucleons. So this is your number of protons plus neutrons. And so like the normal phosphorus is going to be P31. It's going to have 15 protons and 16 neutrons. And so this is, this is nice and comfy, the nucleus is happy, but what happens if you add another nucle if you add another neutron? Now you have a new, you have 17, um, you have 17 neutrons. And so you have 17 plus 15 is going to be 32. So you have 32 nucleons. And so this is why we call it P32. So we have P32 and this is going to be uncomfy. So we can undergo what we call beta minus decay. So there's just different types of radioactive decay and this one undergoes this beta minus decay. Um, and I'm not gonna go into it here, but you should just know that this is going to give off a high energy particle that we're going to be able to detect. So I'll tell you more about the detection later, but typically we're using these like um, screens that we can then put on top and then it will capture the capture the given off energy at the location that's above what where we put it on like our gel or whatever. And so this is going to allow us to see it. Quick note, you might be wondering, wait, if my sample is going turning into sulfur, isn't that going to mess things up? Well, it turns out like you're actually labeling such a tiny, like because you have one, you have only a fraction of your stuff is actually going to be radio labeled. And two, only a fraction of that is going to actually undergo radioactive decay. So we have this thing called the half-life, which is the time it takes for half of it to have decayed. Um, so this is one bad thing about radioactive labeling is that you, your sample, the label becomes useless over time. So the half-life is the time it takes for half of it basically to become useless. And for P32, this is a couple of weeks, so about 14 days. And so this means that over time, my sample, if I go back in two weeks, my sample will be half as high of a signal as before. But it, this is like a random process. And so it's just like on this random process on average is happening. It's not like they all wait until two weeks and then change. Instead, it's happening like over time and um, just like randomly. This is just happens to be like the average kind of after two, two weeks, you have an average of half is gone. But the important thing is like, it'll still be radioactive for like a long time. And so this is telling you that there's still radioactive stuff there that can be undergoing this decay. So the basic idea is you don't really need to worry about it too much. Usually I don't worry about it at all um, for my purposes that, that you're actually changing the element and these very tiny amounts um, at random times over time, it doesn't usually have any sort of impact on your experiment. So this P32 is really, really useful if we want to label RNA or DNA because they have the phosphorus like all throughout their backbone. And so when it comes to actually labeling a DNA or RNA, we have some options. So typically what, I, what I'm doing is I'm doing five prime radio labeling. So I'm radio labeling that five prime end. And it turns out that this is often very simple and very useful and very helpful. Um, and I'll get into way more details about how this is actually done. But I also just wanted to mention that there are other ways to label um, DNA to label nucleic acids. And so for example, you might want, to, if you were actually doing some sort of synthesis reaction where you're actually making the DNA or you're making the RNA. So with RNA, it'd be like in vitro transcription. With DNA, you'd be doing some sort of like PCR or run on um, assay or re reverse transcription, something like that. In those cases, you are starting with a primer and so because you have a primer with the PCR, so with the PCR, you're starting with the primer. And so you can have a radioactively labeled primer that you can use to do this. And so in this case, you would actually be radio, you, would, you could end label your primer and then use that. And then your, your DNA or your RNA would be labeled. So in this case, you would still be doing a five prime labeling, but you'd be labeling your primer, um, which is then going to serve as the end of the entire sequence. You can also, what you can do is you can actually, in either of these cases, you can use radioactive NTPs. So you can stick in radioactive versions of DNA or RNA, and then this is going to allow you to body label. So when this is getting made, it's going to incorporate these radioactive um, nucleotides all throughout the body of your DNA or your RNA.
And so there are different reasons why you would want to use different things for different purposes. But I'm going to talk most about this five prime labeling um, and how we actually go about doing this in practice. So this is an overview and we're gonna go into more detail about all of these things. But basically we're going to get our RNA ready and then we're going to do this reaction where we're using a polynucleotide kinase to transfer the phosphate group from a radioactive version of ATP that we can order onto the end of our, of our oligonucleotide. And then after the reaction goes, we then stop it and then we purify it to get rid of any free ATP. And then we can run a gel like a urea page gel to see that it was actually, um, it looks all pure and good and labeled and happy. So let's go into details about this stuff. So typically I'm using this polynucleotide kinase, um, PNK, like T4 polynucleotide kinase. And this is going to add a phosphate group from the gamma phosphate of ATP. So this N phosphate group onto a five prime OH. So typically if you, if you have just like a normal RNA or whatever, if it was normally made at well at the one end, it might have a five prime if you were doing some sort of in vitro transcription. Or if you were to get it from cutting the strand, then you would have a, um, a monophosphate group. But you would have a, some sort of phosphate group at the five prime end. However, when we order DNA or RNA made, it's actually made in this kind of reverse way. And so the consequence of this is that, so they're adding basically three prime to five prime. And the consequence is that it's going to have a free five prime OH unless you order it specifically to have a phosphate group there. And you typically don't because they're gonna charge you extra for that. And so for our purposes, this is going to be helpful because we don't have to do any sort of phosphatase step in order to remove it. But if you do have a phosphate group there, you do need to remove it. But then you also need to make sure that it's some sort of phosphatase that you can actually heat and activate or somehow else inactivate it. So it's not going to take off the phosphate group that you then add on. So when we do this, we are going to use um, this. You can just basically order this radioactive, all these radioactive versions of these nucleotides um, from like Perkin Elmer, or this is where we get ours, and they come in this little lead lined um, like bottle. And this is going to be like, actually using this is the most like dangerous part. So we're using really tiny amounts, but this is going to, the stock of this is going to be like the highest concentration of stuff that you're going to be using. And so you want to be really, really careful when you're going with the stock um, and keep it in the bottle as much as possible. They actually, even on the cap of these, they have a little kind of lid that matches the shape of this lid. So you can use this to unscrew this. So you don't even have to touch this lid. It also comes with um, a, like this dye, this green dye. And so it allows you to like visualize it. But um, this is just details, just so you know what you're kind of looking at when you're doing this. But it, the important thing I wanted to point out is that this, this like gamma 32P, so this is telling it, so this is the phosphate, um, the ATP, where it has this gamma phosphate labeled. If, for example, you're doing a three prime labeling, which you can do with things like an RNA ligase, uh, more complicated methods um, as well, there's various things and various nuances and things like that, which make it more difficult. But one of the things about it too, is that you need to use an alpha, alpha um, P32 label. So actually have this alpha phosphate. So it's alpha, beta, gamma. And there you would need to have this alpha phosphate labeled because that's the one that's actually going to get added on. And this is going to be like a more expensive thing to order. But going back to the, this labeling. So this is an overview of my radio labeling protocol and the exact protocol you use is going to vary on various things. You can find more protocols online. Um, an important thing to know is that with mine, I don't want mine to be like super duper hot. So I'm using really, really tiny amounts of RNA in my assays and radioactivity is so, so sensitive that I don't need every copy to have a radioactive ATP on the end. And so I'm not gonna use as high a concentration of the of the radioactive ATP. 
if you want like every copy to have a radioactive ATP, then you would need to. But for my case, I can just kind of correlate the amount of signal to the amount of RNA, even if not every RNA copy has an actual hot ATP on it. Um, so if that made sense, I hope that made sense. Um, if it didn't, don't worry about it too much. Just know that you might need to add more or less of the actual hot ATP. Typically when you buy an Oligo, it's gonna come in a little tube like this. And on the tube, it's gonna tell you the number of nanomoles. You can add one microliter um, to, per nanomole to get a one millimolar solution. Um, so I keep this as a stock solution and then I dilute out um, to a more convenient concentration for further uses and make aliquots but i keep the stock and um like don't touch it because especially with rna you don't want to be getting in and out of the rna a lot because rna is really fragile speaking of which when you resuspend it so you want to use rna's free water so we i keep like a bottle of water that i only use for my rna and i'm really really careful when i'm using it and I use pipette tips with like the filter tips so that nothing, no like RNAs is from my, or stuff from my pipette is actually gonna get pushed into, into the liquid. Then what I want to do is I'm going to heat it up on a heat block. So just like a incubator heat block, I typically put it at like 94 um, degrees Celsius or so for a couple minutes. What this is going to do, and then I let it gradually cool. What this is gonna do is it's gonna prevent, like if there were any weird secondary structures there that were kind of like hiding the end and keeping it from getting labeled, doing this heat and then cool is gonna kind of like allow those, un, like those weird bonds to, like hydrogen bonding, um, but within like the strand or between strands is going to allow those to like come apart so that I'll have a better success when I go to do my labeling step. So in each of these reactions, what you're going to have is you're going to have, um, in my case, I have two, I'm doing 50 microliter reactions. I have two microliters of my RNA that I've prepared, um, five microliters of the buffer that comes with the kinase, so this polynucleotide kinase buffer, um, 37 microliters of RNA's free water, um, one microliter of the kinase, and then five microliters of hot ATP. And I'll tell you more. So when I'm actually preparing this, I typically make a master mix. So I make a mix, uh, I'm often doing multiple reactions at once. And so I make enough for as if there were like, at, like at least half a reaction extra was worth of the mix. So the buffer, the water, the ATP. And then last I add this kinase and I mix. So I make this master mix and then I add this to each of my separate reactions. So I'll then add 48 microliters per two microliters of RNA. And this helps um, avoid over like having to do a ton of pipetting and also avoids how often you have to go into that vial of hot ATP. Once I make these reactions, once I add it to the RNA, then I incubate it for an hour at 37C. So just in one of those little like heat blocks. In this time, the polynucleotide kinase is going to be labeling the RNA. Then after an hour, I'm going to add two microliters of 10 millimolar cold ATP. So really a high concentration of unlabeled ATP and let it go another hour. So this is a couple purposes. One is that because it's going to make sure that every copy of my RNA has a phosphate group on the end. It might not be a hot phosphate group, but it'll have a phosphate group. And this is sometimes important, especially if you have a protein that relies on binding to a monophosphate group at the end. Another reason why this is helpful is because if you have kinase in there and depending on your purification strategy so if you're doing like a page purification or something after this you have less to worry about but if you're not you could have extra kinase that kind of slip through if this kinase has hot atp with it then it can actually go and actually potentially phosphorylate something that you don't want and so basically by having this cold atp then if you have extra kinase if it had you have a little extra kinase it's going to have to, it's more likely to have um, a cold ATP bound to it. And so it's not gonna make a signal that you can then detect. After doing this, I'm going to purify it. So typically what I'm using is one of these like G25 or G50. And I talked about these more in, the, in, the, in my post the other day, but these desalting columns are actually like a little gel filtration. 
thing. And so they have these tiny little pores and the little things like that ATP and the salts, they're gonna get trapped into the pores of these beads. And the bigger things like your RNA are gonna go around all of those. And so they're not gonna get trapped. And so when you stop the centrifuging, then they're gonna be, they'll have gone through, whereas all that other stuff will be trapped in here. Then I want to check and make sure that it's actually worked. So one thing too is if you're using the ATP with the with the green label, then that like the green dye stuff, that green dye should also be in here, and that's a kind of indicator that the column um, was doing its job because that little dye is stuck. Then I want to check the purity, which I typically do with the urea page gel. So. Um, don't confuse this with SDS page. So with SDS page, we're separating proteins by size. With urea page, we're separating RNA by size. And both of these are using a page gel, so a polyacrylamide gel um, that is basically made up of these cross-linked polyacrylamide chains. They have this mesh. The bigger things are going to get slowed down more as they're traveling through. And so when you're using electricity to get them to move through this gel and then you turn off the electricity, they're gonna be stuck where they were. And so the bigger things are gonna be higher up and the smaller things are gonna be further down. So with SDS page, where with either of these, you wanna make sure that if you have a structure in your, in your RNA or in your protein, that, the pro, that that's not going to interfere with the travel. So you basically wanna separate based on their size, based on their length, and not by their shape. And so the with SDS page, your SDS, this detergent is going to kind of unfold the proteins and keep them in this unfolded state. With urea page, you have this molecule called a urea that's going to do a similar thing. With the um, urea page, you can do these in different size gels, um, these like mini gels, just like you would use for a SDS page, probably um, bigger gels, even bigger gels like sequencing gels, and you're going to run your gel. And then what I do is I wrap it in um, saran wrap and then put one of these screens on. These screens are these like phosphor storage screens, and they're going to trap the radioactive energy. And then they're going to store it for us until we scan it. And so here's a little video that I made um, a while back about this. Detecting scanner. I have this screen and one side I've exposed to my sample and I want to see where the radioactive stuff is. And so I take this and I stick it on this mount and then this it's flipped over and goes into here. And I close the screen. And then the laser is going to come and it's going to excite it. And when the, um, the electrons get excited, then they untrap and then they fall back down and they let out light. And then that light gets um, captured by a detector and it gets amplified and it gets turned into a um, digital signal. And then we use the software um, to help us um, quantify it. So what we have to do is you want to blank it because it's kind of like an Etch-a-Sketch. You need to um, clear it out. And so how you do this is using light. So we have this light table. And when we, um, when we turn it on, it lights up. And what it's doing is it's shining all the, this light and it's all the electrons are excited and they fall back down and then they're ready to do it again. And then when we're done, we stick the screens in this drawer and keep them hidden from light so that they don't um, get over um, so when you're looking at your gel, you want to see nice sharp bands and you don't want to see like a bunch of bands below it or and you don't want to see like a strong bands that you have like free ATP. So the ATP is going to travel fastest so it's going to be would be furthest down. And if you, your column didn't successfully remove the ATP you're going to get like a strong signal of the ATP. And this is a really big problem because you have this free ATP and also because it's top often the ATP is going to have a really, really strong signal.
Um, and then you don't know if the signal you're getting is from your ATP or from your RNA. If you're doing some sort of like slot bot or something like that, where you don't have like a gel to see the actual size is okay. You also don't want to see something where you have a bunch of bands underneath here. And so you can kind of see the suggestion of bands here. Um, so this could indicate that you have some degradation going on. And so RNA is really, really sensitive and you want to make sure that you're not getting degradation. So if you have degradation products and they get labeled or they get degraded after you label them, um, then you'll see like lines appearing down here. And so this is, these are reasons why it's really important that you check the purity of your samples. To run a gel, you want to make sure that you're running like not running a crazy amount of the RNAs. Um, and because you don't want your gel to just be like blazing hot um, because then you can't even like see the signal because you just like oversaturate and you have all these problems and you don't, yeah, don't do that. So typically what I do is I want to load like 500 um, or so counts. And so I'll do like dilute it to 1K per microliter. So I typically take the pipette with one microliter and hold it up to a Geiger counter to see how hot it is. Um, take the counts and then dilute it to 1K per microliter. Mix five microliters of that with five microliters of your urea buffer. So it's going to have the urea that's going to denature things. And then I load two microliters. So I'm loading the equivalent of 1K onto my gel. Um, and then hopefully the gel comes out nice.